Hey folks, it's Matt Zachary, and welcome to Vax On, a weekly segment of my podcast, Out of Patience, right here on the Offscript Media Network. Hey, I'm Alura Nanos. I'm a lawyer, a journalist, a mom of a teenage narcoleptic, and a professional big mouth. Lou and I go back 30 years as best friends, and we're here to have fun and bring you a layperson's guide to what the hell just happened this week in healthcare as America gets its vax on and shows COVID the door. Matt gets me. He knows I'm tired, annoyed, and sometimes pushed to the brink by the intense chaos of our lives right now. We're here together to learn, complain, and include you in the conversation. So join us on Twitter at VaxOnPod and share your stories and grievances using the hashtag VaxOn. Conspiracy theorists and haters shall be neutralized on site. All right, Matt, let's get at it. Hey, welcome back to VaxOn. I'm Andrew McDowell, co-founder and COO of Offscript Health and sometime co-host of Vaxon. Today, we'd like to revisit a previous episode of Vaxon, an episode that we really love because it features the wonderful drag queen misinformation and Krishna Stone from Gay Men's Health Crisis. The AIDS Walk will make its return to Central Park on Sunday, May 15th, 2022. And in preparation for that celebration, we wanted to give new listeners a chance to hear this episode and current listeners a refresher on the topic. Enjoy. Matt, we're here, and I'm so excited. And you are? Laura. Hi there. <laughs> Is this like, we haven't done a show in person in a while. We haven't done a show in person in a while, and boy, is this one going to be a whopper. Really? It is. Tell me more. As promised, I have two very special guests with me today in studio for a very special episode of Vaxon. You mean the people I'm looking at right now, but the listeners don't know they're in the room with us? Exactly. Okay. So we have with us... Krishna Stone. She's the Director of Community Relations for Gay Men's Health Crisis. Hi, Krishna. Welcome aboard. Welcome to Vax On. And guess what? We have, as promised, the Ambassador of Good Health, Virtual Drumroll. Misinformation. (laughs) It's me, Misinformation. I'm here. Thank you so much for coming. We are so excited to have you. And we have a lot to do, and we need to get to it. Thank you so much for having me. It's so exciting. We, this is just fantastic. Our listeners are going to just, like, their heads are exploding it's right amazing. now as we speak. So misinformation is here uh, through a partnership between FCB Health and Gay Men's Health Crisis. And we have lots to talk about what you're doing and why you're doing it and what kind of flair you're doing it with. Yes. So let's get to it. Okay. So is it inappropriate to say I've never been this close to a drag queen and I feel great? Yeah. Of course you feel great. Get closer, baby. You know, I don't. Uh, no, no, I have. I've touched a drag, drag <laughs> oh, queen. Yeah. yeah, I know. Well, you are a drag queen, I, I think. Know. Too. You are so. so I am too. Hello? In spirit. In yes. Spirit. <laughs> spirit. Drag queen spirit. Yes. So misinformation, in all seriousness, I really want you to tell us what are you doing? What's your mission? And how are you doing it? Can you can you give us a little background? That's a great question. What is our mission? Uh, we basically combat the misinformation. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> of it all that we might see um, on the news or on social media. So we just combat that and raise awareness and bring people in to, to get excited about getting vaccinated. And this is specifically misinformation that is directed at COVID-19 and the COVID vaccine. Correct. What is this misinformation of which you speak? We've, we've done this show so long, I have no idea what we're talking about. I know. For real. You know, so I want to talk a little bit about what the need for dispelling misinformation is. You know, you are a specifically an ambassador to the LGBTQ community. And is there a reason why that community needs targeting? Well, yes. In my opinion, I feel that the LGBT plus community um, has, you know, maybe not had the best experience with the medical field. You think? You think? Girl, (laughs) hello. So, um, you know, we just want to 
dispel all these myths that we hear you know once rumor one rumor starts it, it tumbleweaves and turns into something else and then you know things that are totally false we tend to some people if you're ill-informed tend to take that as the truth so that happens often so yeah. we want to make sure that doesn't happen in our community and you know we've talked before a little bit on this show about how if you are a member of an often marginalized community you can be more susceptible to misinformation and disinformation campaigns, because you've already been in situations where you're kind of a very real victim mm -hmm. of the establishment. You know, it can be if you're a member of, you know, an often marginalized community, you might not know who to believe or what to do. Um, and who's advocating for you. Exactly. At that exactly. And, and I think it's fantastic that you're here to both advocate for and educate this very special community. We're going to slay um, those myths, baby. How are you doing it? Can you explain to us? Like, so what are you doing? Like, you know, talk to me about dispelling those myths. We are, you know, talking to actual people who know what they're talking about, not our cousins on Facebook. We have a team of people who give us the facts. And I am here to be an ambassador and make sure that we're spilling the tea on the facts about the vaccine. We're not going with things that we're just like reading on Twitter. That's just like word vomit. And, you know, I think that uh, what I really love about what you're doing is that as important as it is for people to get vaccinated, you're focusing not on, you know, the general topic of just vaccines and how do we feel about them. But we're like, listen, there are facts and then there's bullshit. So let's talk about what's real and what's fake. And then you take that and you do with it what you will. Yes. And I think that that's so effective. And I try to do it with love and compassion. You know, I'm not going to drag the girls. Not like me. Like I do, <laughs> I do it with bitchiness and impatience. That's called antithetical. Yeah, it is. I'm sorry. So I, I, I'm going to I'm going to look to misinformation as as something of a life coach in this. Yeah, I got you, baby. Yeah. Everyone can be saved a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, can I nerd out for a second? Nerd out. Um, because I know we have one of the legacy luminary, most extraordinary nonprofit organizations represented mm -hmm. here. And as a nonprofit here, I'll say an expatriated nonprofit here who's been mingling in nonprofits for 20 years. I mean, genuflecting. We're not worthy. GMC, <laughs> they paved the way for what I wound up doing for the cancer community. Yeah. GMHC is like the OG nonprofit, right? Yeah. So I just like all Thank due you. respect, all Wayne and Garth, not worthy stuff. Thank you so much for not just being here, but for taking on the mantle for this. I can imagine it was a massive decision on the part of leadership to we're going to dive into this. I think it was a very clear you know, decision. I don't, it was not a hard decision. It's just, we knew we had to do this, you know, because GMHC, you know, grew from disaster mm. you know, when in the eighties, when men were, gay men were dying of AIDS. And so in August of, August of 81, our six founders and their supporters gathered in some, in Larry Kramer, the late Larry Kramer's living room, and because they knew they had to do something. And that is a very natural response to disasters when people gather mm. to figure out what to do. What can we do? That is a very natural, it's a very organic and courageous uh, moment in someone's life to say, I, I have to do something. I have to fight AIDS. I have to fight homophobia, transphobia, racism, and the list goes on. So being of service is very much a part of my life. I grew up in a home where service was important, you know, especially since my parents grew through the civil rights movement and, you know, volunteering was essential. And then I connected to women's rights movement and LGBTQ plus rights movement. So I started as a volunteer in 1986 because my friends and colleagues were dying. And I had to do something. And so uh, I started volunteering at GMHC. And then I got hired in 1993. It's the Margaret Mead story, the consummate Margaret Mead story. Yeah, I'm just like, I don't know. If there a nonprofit fanboying, is that a thing? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, if is. there is anything that's worthy of it, I think it is. Yes. It is long-term nonprofit work. Tell me a little bit about, you know, you talked about the kind of the birth of gay men's health crisis um, and it grew out of, you know, a crisis. And when COVID-19 happened, was it that same feeling like, oh, shit, like it's another huge bomb that just dropped and mm. we have to do something? That's right. So when, you know, in mid-March of 2020, we actually had to shut down our offices. However, we knew we couldn't close. That was not mm. an option. So we uh, pivoted to 
providing services and uh, programs remotely. However, we also, instead of having the meals program where, where our clients would come for lunches and, and then on Friday for dinner, we handed out, we packed and handed out uh, bags of groceries. And that mm-hmm. has been uh, a constant for us since then. Um, the other thing about GMHC is that from the very beginning, we understood that it was important to provide education and awareness without shaming people and without being judgmental. So uh, in July of 2020, we partnered with two um, entertainment uh, promoters, uh, Daniel Nardiccio and Taylor Schubert, and they do work in the Pines as well as all over the city. So they worked with us to create uh, COVID destroyers. So we had drag queens <laughs> That's and awesome. this is only awesome. dancers, and we would go out to the where the ferries arrive and hand out, you know, face masks, hand sanitizer, and also a guide from the Department of Health on safer sex in the time of COVID-19. I mm-hmm. did see that. Oh, and I, I remember it, it because it actually made the the rounds around the internet. And oh, I just remember it. like hanging with my mom friends being like, these people are freaking brilliant. Like, yeah. Just the, <laughs> yeah, the health department nailed it. Oh my it. God, yeah. it was so <laughs> yeah. good. I remember being like, whose job is it to write this stuff? Because it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I, what I want to ask is, so, I mean, obviously this is such an important initiative. You're doing such important work, both of you. What is it about drag queens that's just different, that delivers a message just differently? That's a question that answers itself. <laughs> no, no. I mean, like, All the right why, I guess the question is, why does it work? Why does, why does delivering the message through the vehicle of a drag queen, yeah. why is that more effective? I think drag queens are for the people and of the people, you know, and we bring light and laughter and we perform and we're all about making sure our audience and our community is seen and feeling a connection emotionally. So I think it makes sense for a drag queen to to promote and educate people on this issue. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think you're you're very right about that. And and I feel like when I tried to explain to like my friends, where am mm-hmm. I going today? And I, and I was busy and running out of the house. And I was like, well, I'm going to do this podcast with COVID and the vaccine and a drag queen. And they were like, <laughs> what? <laughs> like that doesn't fit together. Oh, but it does. But it does. But it does. Yeah, <laughs> it, does. it actually very much fits together. I think the drag queens are healers. Mm. I really do. I think that they're teachers, they're healers, they're entertainers. They are, it's a multi-layered uh, experience of being in the presence of drag queens because they make life accessible. You know, like we lean to you and you lean to us while you're performing, while you're talking, while you're advocating. You know, it's a powerful form of activism, you know, and I think that this work when you're combining COVID-19 pandemic, HIV and AIDS epidemic, we need all the help we can get, you know, and and the more creative, the better. Yeah. If there's a upper 10% on the bell curve of joy, all the drag queens are there. That's a really important point that when we're dealing with difficult issues, you know, COVID-19 is a difficult issue for everyone, for our whole world. But to remember that the way we're going to combat this and the way we're going to come out on top is to access those moments of joy and to understand what works to connect people with each other. And um, and I, I'm so thrilled to see that both FCB Health and GMHC came together to give us all this gift that is misinformation. <laughs> So if you guys were able to like whittle down the stick and sift the flour, what would be the top two or three specific things that keep coming back as the top myths you are dispelling or trying to dispel? That vaccines don't work. That's like number one. That's number one. 100%. And that connects to the mistrust of medical providers, which is not new, that uh, you could die from it well, and uh, that it's more harmful. Wait, die from the vaccine? Mm-hmm. That I've heard that. And that also I was reminded of how back in the early years of the HIV and AIDS epidemic, there was misinformation about the first drug, AZT. 
And did AZT kill people? Did they die of AIDS because of AZT or because of this leader or this leader? And so it's like we're repeating history again around the despair and the need to spread misinformation in order to feel powerful or to combat fear or whatever is going on. Can and you imagine how much worse it would have been if there was Twitter back then? Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh. You were blessed to not have Twitter. Yeah, yeah we really were. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what also is perpetuating the the myth, as, as misinformation said. It's like it's even harder to catch up with all this, the the gossip, the misinformation, the inaccuracies, the you know, the fear um, because of social media, you know, the Internet. It so. spreads like wildfire. Yeah. And we trust a lot of people close to us, you know, yeah. so we expect what they're saying to be the truth. Because why would they lie to us or why would they give us misinformation? But it happens. Sure. It definitely. Telephone, rumors. Right. Oops. Even when people have good intentions, mm -hmm. we often see that bullshit information just travels like, you know, so fast. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the person ultimately receiving it it, like has no way of realizing that the origin was, you know, something completely not trustworthy because it came to them from a source that they trust. Mm -hmm. And it sucks because I think when you're, as you're saying this, I'm thinking about journalism and the news. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, if you study journalism, you're supposed to give the hard facts and be objective. But we're not seeing that even in the news right now. So the news is continuously giving us misinformation as well. And honey, that's not it. Right. I mean, you're right. And what you have is like all different places and, uh, you know, who's got what agenda and, mm -hmm. and, and you know, it, it becomes right very overwhelming. Left. Yeah. And it's kind of like it's difficult to find the time to sort through the bullshit to find what's real, which is why I, I love your whole platform to say, like, listen, I'm here to tell you what's real. And it doesn't even sound like you're going beyond that. It's like, I'm going to give you the facts and the facts speak for themselves in, in this. And I think that's just so important. Um, speaking of facts, misinformation and Krishna, I don't know if you guys know one of the things that we do here on Vaxon, but we have a partnership with an organization called Sermo, which is a social media platform exclusively for physicians. And it is a worldwide platform with 1.3 million doctors that belong to it. And we have a partnership with Sermo that allows us to poll their participants, poll their doctors, ask questions, and then get the data back about what these doctors say. And it's often really interesting, especially because the doctors are not even just U.S. doctors. They're across the world. And sometimes it's just nice to know, like, is this something that doctors themselves are split on? Is this something that doctors are unified on? And, and like, what do you think to get a kind of landscape for how things go? So each week we share a sermo poll in what we call our sermo moment. Sermo moment. <laughs> sermo moment. So <laughs> hit that note. <laughs> yeah. In preparation for you ladies to come in the studio, we asked questions that relate to your mission, misinformation. Mm -hmm. And here's what we asked. To doctors, have your LGBTQ plus patients gotten vaccinated at a lower rate than other patients? And 21% said, yes, their LGBTQ patients are getting vaccinated at a lower rate. 7% said, no, they're getting vaccinated more than other patients. The majority, 71% of the doctors reported that they have not observed any meaningful difference in vaccination rates between the LGBTQ plus community and the rest of the general public. I like that. Interesting. Stat. That's good. Yeah, it, th that is good. Um, I actually, if you had asked me just as a person walking down the street, I would have said, yeah, that community is probably vaccinated more than everybody else. And it also depends on where. Yeah. You, get, yes. you know, I, so, uh, you know, so if it's in, you know, Eastern Europe or Africa or other parts, there may be, you know, yeah, less we don't folks. have that yeah. granularity yeah. to this. Oh, this okay. is more yeah. of a so, generic global part. You know, uh, I am interested to hear, though, like so. So, Krishna, this is really probably your area of expertise. What is your sense of the need to specifically identify this community as needing to have misinformation dispelled? Is there a special need for this community or is it just that they're especially easy to reach? I think that it's important to reach the LGBTQ plus community, especially folks, uh, black and brown people in particular, uh, because of the history of discrimination, stigma, violence, and all of these obstacles that can prevent LGBTQ plus people from accessing health care and being treated well 
you know, with medical providers. So it makes sense to me that this campaign is targeting or focused on LGBTQ plus people. Let me respond to that because question two basically validates everything you just said. Question two was if the doctors like, why do you think LGBTQ are getting vaccinated at a lower rate? And 28% said misinformation. Hey, who I'm staring at right me. now. It's not me. Not, not it's her. Not me, not her. <laughs> but 45% said general mistrust of the industry. Right. Right. Which is very telling. Yes. Right. So, you know, you have nine percent that said, oh, well, they have they have a lower fear of contracting COVID-19. So they might think that they don't need it as much. And 19 percent had something else. But I think they were that busy shopping. They- <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, then. <laughs> but I think that that but the, the, the number that is, I think, really telling there is 45 percent said they these doctors know that members of the LGBTQ plus community have a reason to distrust mm. the general medical industry. Um, and, and that's not surprising for any marginalized community, any community that's been victimized, particularly by, um, you know, large institutions in the past. But what's surprising about it is that the medical community is woke to that. They're trying. I was I like, mean, hopefully. At <laughs> they're at trying. Least doctors that use yeah. Sermo are woke. The Sermo doctors okay, seem yeah, to be woke. That was going to be my inquiry. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Like, is it, is oh, it a sorry. skewed sample? Okay. Yeah. Like, are, are, are Sermo docs extra woke? There's more than 1.3 million doctors yeah. in the world. Right. Mm. The other element, too, is that gay and bisexual men of color, as well as transgender women of color, are still disproportionately impacted by HIV and AIDS. So then you add on all of the other challenges that this community faces, um, there's a lot going on, you know, unstable housing, mental health and substance use issues, police brutality. Right. You could actually um, put in a host of other shitty things in that in that statistic. And it would still apply to those subsets of the community. Yeah. So. So, yeah. So, I mean, so you're dealing with a community that's already stretched thin. Yeah. uh, Facing unique challenges, facing harsher challenges. Not feeling safe or seen. It's right. hard enough already. Right. <laughs> Let alone right. lobbying okay. vaccine misinformation. Right. So, and, and and it seems very much like when it comes to the COVID vaccine, it's in some ways not as complicated as other things. Um, because, you know, for example, if you compare it with something like, you know, drug abuse, where there are a zillion causes and a zillion solutions, and it's very complex. Um, but the COVID vaccine is not so complex. It works, it's safe. Get it. <laughs> right. Please, please, right. please. <laughs> and we also want to, while we recognize the challenges that are faced by LGBTQ plus folks, we also want to recognize and honor the contributions of LGBTQ plus people. And we want to listen, you know, to what they need. We don't want to tell them what to do. You know, we need to listen and learn and come together in that manner so that we can best figure out, like, what are our next steps, you know, in this COVID-19 experience? So this goes to the third question, which, again, kind of revalidates the CERMO community for their response, where 76% of doctors from moderately important to very important say there must be specific focus to target LGBT communities on misinformation. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly what you do. Again, I think it's it's important. It's really important work in a time during a global pandemic. It's perhaps the most important work. Um, I want to know before we move to our final segment, I want to know misinformation. What have you found? Like, what is your favorite thing to talk about with people? Like, what's your favorite myth to dispel? What do you love to, to tell people, um, you know, when you have the real facts and, and they have the wrong ones? What's my favorite myth to dispel? Um, I mean, we are, I was just talking about this to someone else, but I think, you know, what we put in our body is really important to get the best out of it. I'm a firm believer in that. Um, And I've heard that, you know, with the correct diet, you will not get COVID-19. And, you know, that's- I would love to know what that diet might be. (laughs) Organic, you know. Is it so organic? But but Is it no carbs? Because I don't want that diet. No, I don't want that either, girl. (laughs) It's it's the raw vegan paleo combined into one. Is it because, like, if you eat that way, you're just so miserable that you can't get off your couch anyway? (laughs) Or is it like you can't get off the toilet long enough to go contract COVID? Like, is that how that works? And 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 in a way, I could see how that might, some people might really- pull towards that. We went through that with the epidemic, HIV and AIDS epidemic, that people believe that if they ate the right foods or whatever, that they wouldn't contract. Mm -hmm. 
So look at that. The parallel is still there. It's still there. Well, I mean, they're both viruses, right? So mm-hmm. it's, there's going to be a lot of that, like, what do I have to do to not get this virus? Or, you know, and and a lot of it is, I think, people hoping that there is something that you could do to not get it. But the totally. good news is there is something you can do. It's called get the fucking vaccine. <laughs> so like, <laughs> Vaccine, boosters, all of it, please. <laughs> well, the sky is Wear only mask. falling for people who get hit by it. <laughs> oh, that's that seems that's, profound. That's very <laughs> profound. That's deep. Can I have that? You can a, have that. Can I, I'll can say I, it again for the I cheap. Need stick. I need the a sticker. The sky is only falling for those who get hit by it. We need that on a shirt. We need t-shirts. Yeah. We need shirts. All right, last okay. question before we go to break. Do you have any one particular gestalt aha moment where you saw somebody's eyes open wide and say, yes, you've changed my mind. I'm getting the shot. When I talk to people about the COVID-19 vaccine, I just try to create a safe space for them to hear me and let them know that they are safe, and, you know, so they can ask questions. And what I've noticed is that when I think I'm reaching someone, they kind of exhale mm-hmm. and they're like, oh, OK. You know, and then it's like, now I can hear you. Now I think I'm able to move move through this process to get a vaccine. I think what's really important is asking questions. So I think I think in in your way of doing it was exactly what they needed to hear. They didn't want to we don't want to be attacked or have things thrown at us. You know, maybe it's not always the best thing to have st- statistics thrown at you in order to get yeah, a result. Statistics never change anybody's yeah. mind yeah. usually, so right? So I think I think the best way even even in like having a debate with someone, just ask questions, ask the right questions, um, have empathy. And um, you don't have to spill the tea whether or not you're getting vaccinated with me, but I can to- I've can i totally seen people change their demeanor. There are people who are not vaccinated and they almost seem proud about it. Like, mm, why would I do that? And then you ask- They're like the above right- it. Yeah. And then you ask questions and you find out there's other things at hand, you know? Oh yeah, it's multi-layered. Exactly, always. Multi-layered experience of why people come to that decision uh, of not getting vaccinated, and it takes a little bit more of a dialogue to to try to reach that person to say, you know, this is this is not working for you, honey. My roommate uh, made a parallel about this with HIV status or STI status, and I was I was really curious and confused. But he said that he just assumes that everyone has it. You just have to assume that everyone has COVID or. HIV or an STI. So what I think is helpful is talking about your status. And now I'm talking about COVID. So to openly talk about that and, and having those discussions and making it relatable. Right, to say, like, I've chosen to get vaccinated yeah. and here's why. Why, and is- how you felt. Yeah. And I think that that makes it relatable and personal. And we can't really debate those experiences. Right, because our, it's our own experiences. Period. I think that's a great point. It really is. And, it, you know, there's so much stigma still. Uh, connected to people living with HIV, and there's, you know, and certainly stigma attached to people who've experienced COVID-19. And so to be able to say courageously, Mm -hmm. you know, know, a person says, I'm HIV positive, and I I also got the vaccine, you know, and it's just like, oh, wow. Okay. All right. I think it's time to take a break. Yep. Let's go make some money with some ads, girl. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice-monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. Okay, we're back. And for our last segment, I had to share this story with you guys because I thought it was hilarious. And More of a stunt. A it story. was a stunt, but but on, so stunts. good, right? So one of the reasons why everything that misinformation is doing is so important and why it's working is because it's creative. Like, you know, who would have said, oh, yeah, a drag queen bringing, uh, you know, dispelling vaccine myths. That makes perfect sense. But then it works because it really does. So this kind of creative thinking is what we need right now. So 
I, I saw this story and I had to share it with you guys in case you hadn't seen it. There was a black truck. The truck is driving around Charlotte, North Carolina. It says on the side, Wilmore Funeral Home. And then it has a message, don't get vaccinated. <laughs> so it looked like it was like an anti-vax message, which is really kind of ballsy, right? Right. But the catch is there is no Wilmore Funeral Home. If you go to the website, which was also written on the truck, it actually is a get vaccinated now message. And it says, if not, we'll see you soon. Oh, girl. Which is, which <laughs> is brilliant. I mean, brilliant. Yes. it's a brilliant <laughs> campaign. But it is brilliant, right? Because people who might be inclined to go check this out then got there and were like, oh, it's not like an anti-vax funeral home. Um, it, it was the whole thing was done by an ad agency who, you know, they hired at the truck and they had this hidden message. And um, I thought it was great. What a way to draw a business for a fake funeral home. <laughs> right? I, it, I went viral, you guys to... it went viral. Um, and the people who were going, going to like dig and find the truth found that link and then were like, oh, OK, OK, I see you. I see yeah, you. Yeah, it's great, right? <laughs> Yeah, I, I tell people often there are many, many different forms of activism. And when I saw that, you know, campaign, I just thought that is just so remarkably beautiful and smart. And so that's what we need more of. That's like, what do they call it? That's uh, guerrilla marketing. Guerrilla marketing, marketing right? Yes. Which I think is all of the people that do those kind of things are so brilliant. Like that's just a way that someone's brain works. Um, but I think that... All of these things, whether it's misinformation, going out there and talking to people, you know, whether it's spreading things in your own family and friends in a way that just works. I think all of the creativity and all the effort is exactly what we need right now. Krishna, can I do another GMHC fanboy question? Yes, please, <laughs> fanboy. So my listeners know that our company recently produced a groundbreaking eight-part narrative series about the 50-year history of cancer advocacy. It's the 50th anniversary of the National Cancer Act. And it's basically about the human beings, the Margaret Meads, that pushed Congress, that forced doctors, that changed mastectomy, they, the uphill battles of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And with that perspective, it kind of pales in comparison to the challenges we have today when we're just not dying every day anymore. So... Can you comment from your perspective in the industry and as an advocate in this space for so long, how do you compare today's challenges as better than the alternative challenges of the 80s? Well, this year marks the 40th year of the HIV and AIDS epidemic. And there are certainly when we reflect about the early 80s, we call them the plague years. And so there's much to reflect on and learn from. It's important to share about those stories, watch documentaries, listen to people who lived it, like long-term survivors who have been living with HIV and AIDS, you know, 15 years plus, 20 plus, 30 plus years. So there's much to learn from and much to exchange around information. And the reality is that we still have so much work to do. I think it's, it's also particularly important to our youth. Um, who may not be aware of the, you know, the origins of the epidemic and where it's led us in these past 40 years. So we pay attention, especially for our youth, you know, towards our youth, you know, to let them know this is how this all began and that they can be of service. You know, I speak a lot to groups of youth. And so, you know, they have no idea about the, the start of the epidemic. And when they become more knowledgeable, then it's like, now I want you to figure out the ways that you can be activists. You don't have to get arrested. You right. can mm -hmm. create videos. You can write about it. You can, you know, many different ways. You can do it in your own way. And right. I, I, right. Such an important message and such important work. And thank you for all that you do and all that GMHC does. Thank, thank you. you. I so appreciate much. that. Ms. Information, your perspective on the last decade or two being a member of this community? I think about the first time I went to the Pride Parade. I was 16 years old, and I felt so overwhelmed with joy because it was the first time where I felt like I wasn't alone. Like there was a community of people who were like me, who had similar experiences as me, who've overcome, and there were people on the side just like, yes, Queen, you look good, and I love your shirt. And I just felt so good and felt seen. It was the first time I just really felt like connected. 
knowing that like other people did their part to make it easier for me to come out. And and that family vibe, that that energy, I think we can still accomplish that with COVID and getting vaccinated. I think it's so relate, relatable in terms of like taking care of each other and and ourselves. Right we need now. joy. Amazing. We need optimism. We need happiness. We yeah. need love. And what a better way to do it. And this is the, the this is the packet. Like I, everyone needs to be in here with us to see Miss Information with her fabulous leopard outfit, with her beautiful hair and her gorgeous face. You were just looking at face. my breasts. I was. I was looking at her. <laughs> Sorry. She's got these like amazing red stilettos on. And yes. it's like, this is the package that all good things come in. Honestly, yes. Yes. it really is. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, Miss Information, I have two questions for you just to end our show today. Number one, where can we see you? Where are you going to be that we can see you? Got you. Yes, you can find more information and content on Instagram at The Real Misinformation, or you can check out my website, TheRealMisinformation.com. And that's M S. Yes. And we will link to that in the episode description. Absolutely. And Krishna, please tell us I know that there is a live event coming up uh, mm. that everyone can experience the wonder that is misinformation. Tell us a little about that. Yes, we are delighted to have misinformation be a guest panelist. Uh, among three other panelists, and she's going to be part of the town hall called Clap If You're Confused, a virtual town hall on what now, what's next in the time of COVID-19. So we have misinformation, we have an epidemiologist, a therapist, a journalist, and I'm going to be the moderator. And so we're going to continue to sort out misinformation uh, we will talk about resources. We will talk about our experiences during this time of COVID-19 and how we can support each other. You know, COVID-19 is going to be with us for a while. So the more that we can join together and have brave and fabulous and honest conversations, the better. That sounds awesome. And where can people access that oh, if they'd like yes. to attend? So the town hall, the virtual town hall will be on Thursday, October 7th, 4 to 530 the information is on the website, gmhc.org. Uh, it's also on GMHC's Facebook page, Twitter, and Instagram. I think the Wonderful. moral of the story today is get the fucking vaccine. <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Krishna Stone from GMHC. Thank you. Thanks to FCB Health. Thank you to Gay Men's Health Crisis. Thank you to Matthew Zachary. And most of all, thank you to our very special guest, Misinformation. misinformation. Will you come back again oh. and uh, and call into the show sometimes and just check up on us? Yes, Queen. I would love that. Bring me back. Bring me back. Thank you so much. This was really wonderful. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Slay safe. That's all for now. If you like Facts On, be sure to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. Tell us your shit show of a healthcare story by leaving a message for us at 855-AUDIO-66, and we might just use it in a future show. Vaxon is a product of Offscript Health. We are a healthcare engagement company built for patients and caregivers by patients and caregivers. Our executive producers are Matthew Zachary and Andrew McDowell. Our senior producer is Brianna Seeley. Our hosts are Matthew Zachary and Alora Nanos. It is recorded, mixed, and edited by Brianna Seeley. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscriptnot.com. That's media at offscript.com. For more information, visit offscript.com.